Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the Realignment Podcast. We've got a great episode today. My favorite Realignment guests are folks who tend to find themselves at inconvenient points of the ever-shifting political spectrum during the realignment of our political party system. Today's guest, Saur Bramari, here to talk about his new book, Tyranny Inc., is exactly the sort of guest who finds himself in that position. On the one hand, he's very socially conservative. He's deeply skeptical of our policy in Ukraine. On the other, though, he is also describing himself as a new dealer. His book is about how private power, not just government power, could often impede our approach to liberty, something which he critiques the right as not being focused enough on. He also is going to come out and praise certain aspects of the Biden administration's approach to this project. So there's a lot of uh, not incoherent, but definitely complicated political valences there. Hope you all enjoyed the conversation. And of course, a huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. So Robert Mari, welcome to The Realignment. It's good to be back here. Yeah, it's great to uh, chat with you again now that you've got uh, another book. You're quite prolific. I want to kind of start here just because labels are both unhelpful but also helpful. Um, in some of the reviews of your new book, Tyranny, Inc., you've been referred to as a post-liberal I'd like to get it from you. Like, where would you place yourself on this kind of confusing 2020s era political spectrum? Yeah, I I think post-liberal is fine. I've sometimes used the label. The problem is that it defines itself in the negative against, you know, something as opposed to a positive vision. So um, you know, in the sense I'm a post-liberal in the sense that I don't think that the ultimate goal of a political community should be to maximize individual autonomy, but rather to secure the good of the whole. And that's, you know, woven through the entire Western tradition. So it's it's not a novel idea. It's just we're so used to liberal ideals about the point of politics being to maximize individual liberty that, that it, it sometimes sh shocks unfamiliar ears, but really that's you know, politics being about the common good is is Aristotle, it's St. Thomas. And in complicated ways, it's also woven through the American tradition as well. The American tradition, the real thing, the real textured thing, as opposed to the sort of airbrushed founding sort of uh, worship that you see, you know, at conservative think tanks and, um, you know, congressional re retreats for congressional staffers uh, of the GOP. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think post-liberal is fine. Another label that I think comes across more positively was actually flung at me by a critic, namely Jonah Goldberg. Um, I organized a conference on political economy at uh, Franciscan University last year, and Jonah was watching the proceedings, and he said, these guys are just pro-life uh what did he say? Yeah, these guys are just pro-life New Dealers. And, um, you know, of course, as one does in the age of, of social media, I immediately changed my Twitter bio to read pro-life New Dealer because I'm, um, you know, I'm uh, in fact, one should note that most of the actual New Dealers were still pro-life because this is 1930s we're talking about. But, um, you know, I'm economically um, precisely because, uh, you know, I, I want a more moral politics uh, geared toward the common good, I'm, uh, you know, economically left, to put it bluntly. Uh, in fact, The Economist magazine said of the book that my proposals are often scarcely different from what you would expect from Senator Sanders and Warren. Um, but some some of the same kind of moral impulses that uh, that draw me to the left economically also put me on the conventional right on social issues like abortion, euthanasia, and so forth. So I think pro-life New Dealer is just a better label. And I, I welcome the fact that it was that it was meant as a as a smear, as an attack. You know, one one should uh, take ownership of such things. Yeah, it's funny. You are within the firm American political tradition of critics offering labels that are adopted. Think of the original neoconservatives. That was the that was a pejorative attack that was yes, was, was adopted. But now, obviously, like neocon is a pejorative, like once again. But if it's the 1970s, that's a label that was like accepted and welcome. So people should probably spend less time trying to um, label themselves and accept um, some outside critiques. But actually, this is the perfect pivot 
to the actual book topic given that answer. So you are saying that so much of your thought is pushing back against um, hyper individualism over the common good, yet you've written a book that is about tyranny and the removal and limiting of liberty um, via private power. So tie this all together then. Like, how did you go from, let's focus, like, so for example, like it's 2023, you could have written your big 2024 book about common good conservatism, the, you know, New Deal pro-lifer manifesto. Instead, you're writing about private tyranny. So explain that juxtaposition. Sure. Well, it's it's worth talking about what, what I define as uh, private tyranny or tyranny inc as the book's title suggests um americans anglo-americans in general americans especially but a, a certain kind of post 1980s republican or conservative above all is used to thinking of tyranny as only what um government does to us it, what the state does and that's what's that's caused to happen i argue in the book is that it's made us lose sight of something that was familiar again to the classical and Christian tradition, which is the possibility of private coercion and therefore of private tyranny. So I argue and then show through the book, which is mostly a reportorial book as, you know, it's not a theory book as you open it. It's just a one story after another. And each of the stories sheds light on how, um, in our supposedly non-coercive society, we are in fact, uh, surrounded, enveloped by coercion. It's just that this coercion is uh, often meted out by private private actors, employers, you know, monopolistic um, producers, etc. And precisely because our current way of thinking draws such a sharp distinction between public and private, the coercion that we face in the marketplace and the workplace is sort of removed from our contestation, our ability to push back democratically through democratic give and take, through legal justiciability, et cetera. It's all become, this is a zone that you cannot touch. And yet it's the zone where much of our life happens, right? It's the marketplace where we you know, shop, et cetera, for our necessities. It's um, a private space in which we do most of our public discourse, namely the internet and these big platforms. It's the workplace where we spend many, you know, most of our uh, waking life, in fact. Um, and so, and we can get into some of the examples I cite later, but to, to tie it back um, to the kind of classical idea of what politics is about, um, tyranny classically understood is just um, government that um, that is, exists for the benefit of the ruler and not for the, the good of the whole. And it, it therefore, I mean, this is the classical kind of Aristotelian definition of a tyrant is one who rules for himself rather than for the people or for the common good. And uh, therefore, I mean, that, that necessarily implies actually a, a loss of real liberty for the, for the majority, for the asset, asset less many in any society. Um, so what I'm contesting is not the classical definition of tyranny. I accept it. It's just what I, what I'm shedding light on is the possibility at, that the tyranny, the tyrant, needed be the government, and that uh, it, 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 the threats to the common good can come from um, private actors. And paradoxically, often these threats are justified in the name of liberty, when in practice they mean a profound loss of 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 power and of um, rights that ordinary people would expect. So uh, just to give one example, I mean, uh, one of the books, you know, the one that a chapter that's get garnered a lot of attention from early reviewers is um, about the privatization of what ordinary Americans, for the most part, consider eminently public goods, namely um, firefighting, emergency services, over the course of the 20th century, we got used to these things as being services that are uh, based on our taxes and supplied by the government equitably to everyone. But more recently, there's been a rise in growing privatization of these services. So I tell the story of a family whose trailer home, a poor family whose trailer home burned down in Arizona. Um, and the pu public fire department responded, but then also this privatized rural metro, it's a company, responded as well. They didn't do very much. 
but they charged the family $20,000 because they said you hadn't paid for our fire subscription service. Now, the neighborhood pointed out they had never received a plan. They would have happily paid the $400 a year for the useless services if it meant staving off $20,000 bills. Um, and, uh, you know, but the point is that the company wouldn't budge and the family had to turn to crowdfunding. Other families I write about in this in, in that chapter, um, you know, resolved to just eat two meals a day instead of the normal three in order to pay their rural metro private firefighting bills. Um, and so when you have people who are in that position, your your basic liberty that we're, we're, our tradition is supposed to cherish it is severely constrained um, and life has become very hard. And, you, can, you, you know, you can be said to be formally free, but in substance, in fact, um, your liberty, your ability to flourish in community, et cetera, have been hollowed out. And this is why I appreciate having read the book that it's reporterial in that I think it's easy with, and I think this is something that the weaker reviews of your book have been subject to. It's easy to like turn this into a big theoretical debate and not just like engage with the actual and what's happening. Um, so to cite three examples that you start the book off, um, to like over summarize, um, you point out that there are, you know, key stroking incidents where, you know, a worker will log in and like their, there's their keystrokes are logged and the um, employer gets access to their emails, possibly their bank account, et cetera, et cetera. Second, um, you have uh, a requirement effectively in terms of like your pay to attend a Trump rally. Um, we're talking about Shell in 2019. This is Donald Trump once again. So you're being um, nonpartisan in your examples. This doesn't have to like, skew left or right, which I think is kind of like, the broader point here. And then finally, you had early, early, early COVID, um, you know, Amazon workers who were penalized for basically protesting unsafe working conditions. This is way before uh, COVID really um, polarized and before, you know, the clearness around um, safety was that straightforward. So I guess my question is, hearing those three examples, three proposals just seem to be obvious. So A, no key stroking without consent. I'm sure you could pass a law at the state, local, or national level about that. Two, sorry, if it's political speech, you can't force employees to like attend, like maybe they can have some sort of alternative activity. Um, and then three, sorry, if there's a public health emergency, there have to be bare minimum standards that like meet safety requirements. If, you know, if those requirements aren't met, you can't fire people. What would you say your more traditional conservative critics would think is incorrect in what I just kind of stated. Because I think your examples are just helpful ones, right? They, they don't require us to debate the New Deal or Ronald Reagan. It's just sort of like, hey, like we probably shouldn't have non-consensual keystroking, which leads to firing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like, where, where, where's the actual debate when we get into the actual and not the philosophical? Right. Uh, well, I mean, those are all reasonable propositions. Um, you know, I, I think that it, some conservatives would be able to to grant all of those if they were willing to look at the specifics but as you pointed out insofar as the book i mean it, when where we're recording it's actually uh before it's monday august 14th the book comes out on august 15th so most reviews don't appear before the book's publication only a few have so far and kind of predictably um I, the book has received good reviews from the center left like the washington post or the left like jacobin but has received more negative reviews from what you would call libertarian or neoliberal outlets like the Free Beacon or um, the Washington Examiner and uh, The Economist magazine. Um, and so, or, or more critical reviews. Uh, but yeah, insofar as they look at the the specifics, they might be willing to say, well, yeah, well, we would do this or that. Um, but that, and then the point is therefore like, then why do we need a book like this? Because, you know, you could easily, you know, you don't you don't need big reforms to, to deal with these. You could, uh, uh, you could just address it with kind of discrete reforms. But by the way, we won't actually look at any of the concrete issues because they would necessitate looking at uh, concrete reforms. Now, the, the, the proposal that I actually put forward in the book's concluding chapters, which is more of a kind of, well, what, what should we do type of um, series of chapters, is actually one uh, that would address all three, which is actually just restoring the relative balance between labor and capital that was achieved under the New Deal order 
from 1945 roughly to 1973, 75, whenever you know, think about the beginning of the collapse of the New Deal order, it, if you have workplaces where you don't have individual employees, many individual employees going up a rel- against a relatively few employers, that disparity in the number of employers versus employees has always been the source of the of the kind of unjust power of capital over labor. And the way that the New Dealers in the United States and social and Christian Democrats in in across the Atlantic in Europe, the way they address that by is by uh, legislating the possibility of the many employees of mounting countervailing power um, against the few who otherwise control most of society's financial and and productive assets. And this is not so much different from competition, right? So even laissez-faire absolutists will grant that, you know, there could be monopolistic um, sellers in a market and therefore government has the right to intervene in markets to, to in antitrust to, to break up monopolies. Even classical laissez-faire theory grants that, except what we're talking about here is not competition bet- among sellers or among buyers, but rather making possible competition on the other side of the market. Sellers, workers, sellers of labor power, many of them going up against fewer number of employers. All things being equal, what workers will do is just try to, their best and to get by, et cetera, but then they're always vulnerable to the capricious boss, to the keystroking software, to um, you know an accident at work, et cetera, and then suddenly life is turned upside down for them. But if they can if they can band together to exert countervailing power against sellers going up against markets is a form of competition, then the situation becomes just a little bit more balanced. And that's what we had in this country under the New Deal order. And then going back even further, you know, this was these foundations of this were, were really laid in the pre-New Deal era, even by people like President Hoover, surprisingly. If you look into his policies, Hoover is not the same as Calvin Coolidge. He was not this kind of free market fundamentalist. Anyway, I'm giving a digressive answer, but to show how that would address a lot of these problems, um, obviously, if you have if you have a stronger union in place, which is the case of the Amazon workers, um, then capricious firings because they protest um, health conditions, whatever the health condition is, it's COVID or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, will become less likely. Um, the employment agreement is not negotiated by the individual employee going up against the giant firm. And the situation isn't such that, oh, I've taken out a mortgage, I've moved across the country, I've leased the car, now I show up to work and they hand me a bunch of paperwork. No one, very, very few people out of millions of such transactions actually say, oh, you know, I object to that one clause that says you can use keystroke software to monitor my every activity, including my private life. Every people just signed the agreement because the power disparity is so vast. Um, and likewise, you know, it, it, forcing employers to um, to attend captive audience uh, hearings where whatever the ideology may be, whether they're being told about critical race theory and gender ideology or whether it's a Trump rally, the idea of forcing wor- workers to listen to political speech would be addressed, should be addressed by uh, just the original framework of the Wagner Act, which is the 1935 law that um, essentially made it a federal uh, mission to to have collective bargaining at most workplaces. So in instead of doing those kind of con- little fix-it reforms, um, I suggest that the thing to do is to try to shore up the New Deal order. We may have to rethink the Wagner Act because it's shop by shop and ra- instead have regional or sectoral bargaining. Uh, But the bottom line is that just a little bit more balance in the economy and the power between the asset less many and the asset less few would go a long way towards solving a lot of these individual problems. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I think I hit many points. It's an ideas (laughs) book, so it's good to get that out there. I guess the immediate issue that comes to mind, especially when you're talking about critics of this perspective saying, okay, like, why does this require us to reimagine our conception? Um, is just the fact that you're offering a new paradigm for people to kind of think about. Like if you're, I, inter- I interviewed Larry Kramer from the Hewlett Foundation. They've done some interesting work on the post neoliberal space. And kind of their point is that neoliberalism is a paradigm. It's how you're looking at the world. And I think the reason why this idea of private tyranny is important is if you're talking about your average like Republican politician, right? So like not your Josh Hawley, who's writing, you know, 
law school mm-hmm. level like books about Theodore Roosevelt, but you're just your average Republican state legislature, state legislator in a state like Texas or Florida, they just do not have a conception of this concept of private tyranny outside of a wokeness debate, um, which is actually a little separate from what you're talking about here. Um, but I would be curious in those, you know, three anecdotes that you bring up. Obviously, there's a throwaway line about like how, you know, there's, you know, the equivalent for the Trump rally could be like political um, DEI stuff in the workplace. Like, where does wokeness in the sense of DeSantis versus Disney fall into what you're writing about, if it's related at all? Well, it's 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 related in several complicated and interesting ways. Um, for starters, I mean, um, you know, if, if you, as I said, if you just restore a measure of balance in the workplace such that uh, employer employers don't have employees at their utter mercy, then you can mitigate the ideological pressure coming from the from the employer, whatever the ideology may be. And I think that's a a a better long term solution than trying to um, to, to sort of like go to war against individual companies when there is a kind of high profile case of, you know, wokeism or some other ideology being shoved mm-hmm. down the throat of workers. But there's another issue here, which which is where I so far, if you've been listening, you've basically no, noticed that I'm basically almost entirely punching right. But I do punch left, meaning I criticize the existing left a little bit as well, because I think um, a certain kind of, of wokeness, whatever you want to call it, I use the phrase lifestyle leftism, which I borrow from the leader of Germany's left, par- left party, Zara Wagenknecht. Um, she uses lifestyle leftism to describe a kind of leftism or progressivism that is mostly concerned with disciplinary or how ordinary people use language and what kind of thing, uh, products they consume um, and and not concerned with the sort of traditional commitments of of the left, right, of empowering the relatively powerless. And that kind of lifestyle leftism or wokeism, whatever, can actually often serve as a legitimating mechanism for the same old kind of private tyranny that is the subject of most of my books. So just there's a classic case of this, which I mentioned in the book. It's also kind of funny, like the uh, outdoor gear chain REI, which most people are familiar with in big cities, you know, if you want to buy camping gear or whatever, you go to REI. Um, they have this, you know, company podcast. And not too long ago, just a few months ago, they had um, their chief diversity officer doing this podcast. And, you know, she began, hello, my name is so-and-so. I use she, her pronouns. And I just want to acknowledge that I come to you today from the traditional lands of the Olone people. So she did a pronoun check and then she did a land acknowledgement. But the topic of the podcast is why you shouldn't join a labor union, right? Or I give another example of Carolyn Mahoney, who's a progressive lawmaker from New York City, you know, at the height of the pandemic. Um, this story came out in the Times about how average CEOs are making, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times the average worker, uh, the, the highest paid one. Uh, was $211 million a year. Now, this at a time when many people were out of work and, and you know, social solidarity was all the more important because um, so many workers were feeling the, the pressure of job loss and all the insecurity that comes with that. Carolyn Mahoney's response to this wasn't, oh, oh wow, that's really unjust. That's a really unjust distribution of the social income. It was, where are the women CEOs, right? So, you know, I, the lifestyle leftism, wokeism, et cetera, as I argue, tries to sort of fill up the boardroom with like girl bosses instead of old fashioned bosses, but doesn't want to alter the kind of fundamental balance of power too often doesn't. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think I think wokeism does come into it, but it's in a more complex way than the right typically acknowledges, which is just that like Disney wants to trans my kid. And I guess the question I'd have for you is um, kind of take us into your interpretation of the mind of your average um, conservative leader. Why is why is a conservative more attracted to, frankly, in many ways, punishing Disney for being like a center left corporation? And since it's like not shocking that Disney would have, you know, 
be an LGBTQ friendly company. It's not shocking that the Little Mermaid would be black in a new updated portrayal. Those just seem to me to be obvious center left things in the way that it's like not shocking that like Black Rifle Coffee is going to do like conservative boomerism in its like political perspective. It's a vet founded company that's aimed at like pushing back on woke does these seem to be inherent. Why is that pushing back on that more attractive to people on the right than these worker centric realities? Because it's just we've, we've run this experiment, right? Like if it's 2017, 2018, we could have done this podcast, we could say, oh, it's now emerging. Maybe this could go a bunch of directions. Very clearly the wokeness direction got a lot of people on the right more interested in let's question whether or not corporations were up for grabs. What kind of explains why it went one direction, which frankly, if you're seeing kind of like the polling, even conservative voters are kind of getting tired of, like what's going on here? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I was one of the conservatives who, you know, soon after the rise of Trump, warmed up to, to the idea of economic populism, including, uh, but also including uh, this sort of populism in its cultural dimension. Um, but as I've noticed as, as time wore on, especially over the past year or so, I noticed that uh, the much of the right, much of the media class of the right and, and just the conventional GOP in general was learning to rechannel the economic discontents almost entirely into into culturalist grooves uh, uh you know i mean i think first of all we can talk about the failures of the trump administration in this regard uh you know trump came out with again, some great populist promise and as a result of that uh he won the highest share of union households in 2016 uh since ronald reagan and in 1984 but other than China trade, which is admittedly a huge issue, and um, you know the decoupling that he set in motion has been upheld by his Democratic successor. Other than that, you know his administration was sadly all too conventionally Republican. His own signal legislative uh, accomplishment was a corporate tax bonanza that was engineered by Paul Ryan. His Department of Labor was stuffed with union busters like Eugene Scalia. Um, basically, labor usually walked away. Not usually, almost always walked away disappointed from the from the Trump National Labor Relations Board and the Department of Labor. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I kind of blame that on Trump's lack of discipline and the fact that there isn't um, there isn't uh, a kind of personnel that would be, that even knows the language of thinking about economic issues in this way on the right. It's kind of growing. And I know you interview some of the people who are trying to build up that personnel. But on the whole, it's still it's not there. But the the biggest reason why, you know, ultimately the economic populism got channeled almost exclusively into culturalist issues, as exemplified, I would argue, by the DeSantis campaign, but others as well. The main reason is also the one that's the hardest to talk about because small business is so revered in the American tradition, the small time entrepreneur. But it's this, I'll say it, the fact that the power base of the Republican Party, not not necessarily the, the voting base, which is increasingly downscale, but the power base of the party remains, not even the billionaires, although the sociopathic billionaires have their own influence, it remains the small time rich, what you would call small or regional capital, not the, you know, BMWs and Disney's and whatever's of the world, but rather the um, the guy who owns a, a chain of, you know, regional tire distribution centers. Right. That sounds who like goes, the keystroke king. That is that is the keystroke king. <laughs> That's that guy. Yeah. So it's like the, the rubber chicken dinners about the self-made man. And this is a very kind of it's a powerful figure on the right, um, this type of person. And uh, you know, there often are actually there's there's many things that's virtuous about them. They love their communities, etc. But they're in terms of uh waging class warfare, they're in any way, they're in some ways more ferocious than than big capital. And it, the reason is that they feel threatened by the topsy turvy of the market system in a way that big capital does not. Um, and their idea of how to bring um, corporate power to heel is typically, and this goes back to the Jacksonian era, just get rid of the government linked privilege, privileges of the large and let me kind of compete, leave me alone. Um, and that often what that ends up doing is just dismantling 
the, the few mar- sort of regulatory structures that actually help constrain market actors, it redounds to the benefit of the large. It's a kind of, it's actually a kind of, but it doesn't always work well for the small time rich either, but that's their kind of impulse. And it's, it's supremely powerful in the Republican party. Um, now it sounds, it all sounds very pessimistic and grim. The one hope is the fact that even in 2020, especially in 2020, the Trumpian GOP not only consolidated its gains among the white working class, but it began to make encroachments among working class people of color. And so if the Republican Party wants to maintain this new base, it will have to service them. It it will have to at least try to strike some coalitional bargains between the small time rich and the kind of entrepreneurs and between the workers that increasingly form part of its voting base. That's what political parties do, right? They they make deals among their various coalitions. Um, if they don't, they will lose uh, the, the working class because working class people are smart. And as you said, there's there are hints that people are getting tired of everything becomes about woke, right? So like, sorry, I'll stop with this answer, but no, please. You know, Silicon, Sil- Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. There are really complex issues having to do with the problems of small and regional banking in the United States. Again, it's a problem we've inherited from the Jacksonian era. Most industrial countries have a few giant banks that are treated as public utilities almost. Um, the U.S. has these small banks which can't do damage because they're small. It has these huge banks which are super regulated, especially after 2008, 2009. But there's this middle band of banks like Silicon Valley Bank that precisely because they don't fit into either of those two groups, don't have as much regulatory oversight as they probably should. Okay, that's a really complex and important issue. I think the Biden administration dealt with it really well by you know, basically doing bailouts, but then with clawbacks so that ordinary Americans don't feel like their taxes are being used to bail out uh, venture capitalists. What was the Republican response to the crisis? It was, you know why Silicon Valley Bank fell? Because it was woke. Now, if you look at the actual board of the of SVB, the the, the late bank that's not it, it doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> it was all is almost entirely white guys. Like what wokeness are you talking about? And so I think if you keep doing that to voters, voters, especially working class people, are intelligent enough to see through it. And I think they party paid a price for it, this kind of fake populism in 2022. And we'll see with 2024. But if the party wants to retain the working class, it cannot keep doing this kind of thing where, uh, yeah, yeah, we hear you on Wall Street, on big tech, et cetera. But our actual policy agenda is the same old, same old. Well, yeah, and it's and it's funny. And you actually, uh, I, I'm not going to bring up my phone because it's where you do that guest. But you, you've been on quite a, a, a good tweet, uh, you know, cycle for a bit. Um, and you noted that the center left kind of gets the woke vulnerability pretty accurately. Like it's, for example, not a shocker that the New York Times had a uh, very anti-drug decriminalization in my hometown of Portland, Oregon uh, coverage. And the Atlantic did the same thing. And then the Atlantic also had a, hey, I was wrong about trigger warnings article. Like there's a very, it's, I'm not alleging there's a conspiracy where like an email was sent out saying, hey, everyone, we need to like pivot back to the center on like cultural issues, but it's currently happening. I think that's out of concern about Donald Trump coming back. But like, a lot of Republicans just don't understand that it's not 2019 to 2021 where the basically center left is going to get rolled unquestionably by people who are like leftist activists who don't know what they're doing. So basically running up and acting as if it's that period is going to be a disaster. But something I want to go back to, because it's very helpful at explaining why the political coalition you're talking about hasn't come about is when you were talking about labor went to the Trump administration, came away unsatisfied. I know that a lot of conservatives listening were like, yeah, of course they did, because Saurabh, that's the AFL-CIO. That's like the teachers' unions. Those are these big unions, which are operationally mostly political. They serve the Democratic Party. So it's not shocking that those organizations weren't made happy by anything that any, even the most like populist right-wing administration would do. So could you maybe explain how the right should separate maybe distaste for like specific labor organizations from the fact that like we can't just treat like workers as these like disinterested individuals because there's like there's just like weird gap there so kind of yeah, like articulate the like weird in between yeah. you have to navigate 
Yeah, there's first of all the mythology of who's a working class American, which um, in the eyes of the typical member of that conservative power base that I was telling you about, that sort of small time rich or the uh, the small entrepreneur, when he, when they think of the worker, they think of um, typically almost like an uh, a, a, a roofer who has his own independent you know roofing business, um, and it's not at all the or at most a kind of teamster who's a kind of burly teamster, uh, electrician, carpenter, et cetera, they, they will grant that as well. But that's not what the working, the modern working class looks like. There's, you know, uh, low ranked accountants at big accountancies. There's, you know, um, Filipina hospitality workers. Um, you know, frankly, I, I, I would include, and this will probably outrage some conservative listeners, but, you know, uh, the, the kind of permanent professional precariat of the urban cities who are, you know, with student loans bear down on them and they can't, you know, fi find jobs that can pay the minimums in the, the minimum kind of requirements of life. Now you can say, well, you should have been a plumber, but this person was told for a generation, people like him or her have been told for a generation that they should go to college and do kind of informatic jobs and creative class jobs that was going to be the future and now they're stuck with an expensive degree that that you know that doesn't bring a fulfilling stable job um they don't think of these other classes of people as working class americans so that you have you get this very idealized version of who a working class person is that's one point the second point to make is um you know about the point that you made is like okay well you know that's unions etc let me give you an example of how uh, uh, from drawn from the book of a person put in a very difficult position by our current political economy and ultimately by our conservative kind of administrations uh, from Reagan onward. You know, I tell the story of this fellow named Stephen Morris in the book. He was a low-level accountant, not a kind of partner or associate, but low-level accountant working in uh, at Ernst & Young. At, during tax season, uh, he routinely had to work 50, 60 70 hours a week. Uh, and this is a wage job, right? And it uh, made life unbelievably difficult. He would wake up at like six in the morning, get to work by seven, get home at midnight, barely eat, barely sleep, and he's back at work. And this is like, these are the conditions of tax season. We get it. But Ernst and Young, he alleges, didn't pay him overtime. Why was he owed overtime? Because he's not like a salaried high-level staffer. He's a wage employee. And therefore, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the New Deal era law that gives you a minimum wage and overtime protections, uh, he was entitled to overtime as well under California Labor Code. Okay. Now, he wants to sue Ernst and Young to, um, to, to uh, recover his what he believes are his un unjustly withheld wages, which, by the way, amount to about two thousand dollars. Ernst and Young, at some point in Morris's appoint, uh, employment, not at the beginning, but at some point later, sent an email saying, "If you show up to work the next day, effectively, you are required to to route all of your uh, workplace grievances through our mediation and arbitration process." Now, arbitration is this very old, uh, ancient practice, actually, of sending disputes to a neutral mediator for quick resolution rather than going through traditional litigation with all of its kind of expense and drama, et cetera. But it was always meant for merchants of relatively equal bargaining power. Arbitration, these privatized courts, was not meant for situations of vast power disparities like workers in a workplace and an employ a giant global employer like Ernst and Young. Yet since the 1980s, mainly conservative Supreme Court justices gradually expanded the scope of the Federal Arbitration Act to the workplace, to the point that in 2018, uh, writing for a 5-4 majority, Justice Gorsuch, appointed by the populist Trump, held that Morris would have to be forced to do uh, arbitration even though it would have cost him as an individual $200,000 in order to recover uh, $2,000. So in order to recover 1%, uh, he, he, he would have had to spend $200,000 in order to recover 1% of that amount. And Ernst & Young didn't dispute the fact that he would have had to spend $200,000. So it would only make sense for Morris if he wanted to bring the suit to 
be in a class action, either a class action lawsuit or class arbitration, both of which was barred by the arbitration clause that the employer handed down, by the way, again, mid-employment. And the, the, the federal statute under which he brought his suit, the Fair Labor Standards Act, is part of these New Deal package of reforms that were aimed to encourage workers, Congress aimed to encourage workers to band together to defend their rights, including banding together in court to defend their rights when otherwise, if they had to go it individually, it would be irrational. It wouldn't make sense for you to spend $200,000 in order to recover $2,000. It only makes sense if you can band with similarly situated and aggrieved workers. So why am I saying all this? Because that's an easy case of collective action that is obviously within the scope of the, of the Fair Labor Standards Act and of the whole spirit of the New Deal and the idea of workers banding together. And yet here's the Republican Party. Here's Republican appointed uh, Supreme Court justices and the Solicitor General of the Trump administration that took the side of Ernst and Young against the the employees. So AFL-CIO is not involved in this. Now, AFL-CIO, now here's the thing. If, if AFL-CIO was actually more present at more workplaces, situations like that wouldn't come up. Why? Because unions and employers arbitrate disputes all the time. And it's actually, there are studies like libertarian type free market studies that show that arbitration uh, between a union and employer uh, reduces externalities, it reduces costs because right away something happens at work, instead of court, et cetera, management and labor union meet and together they quickly resolve the issue, saving expense and headaches on all sides. So if you just had a more, uh, you know, a workplace that uh, it was more unionized, arbitration even would become acceptable because then it's not giant Ernst and Young, you know, putting its heel on the face, pressing its heel on a heel on the face of one guy, Stephen Morris. It would be a whole bunch of workers arbitrating against you know the large employer. Um, but so again, here's the thing, you know, as you said, like yeah, AFL CIO is super close to Democrats. Why is that? Why has that become the case? AFL CIO, you AFL CIO votes were up for grabs for Republicans as recently as the Reagan era. Reagan was competitive with labor. What changed? Well, the Republican Party post Nixon became unbelievably hostile to labor, as the case of Stephen Morris showed. So if you have a Republican Party that upholds that like unbelievably unjust arbitration agreement uh, in the in the Gorsuch decision, again, appointed by Trump. Um, then labor will go to the one party that at least sometimes takes its side, which is the Democratic Party. But if you have a Republican Party that's willing to be a little bit less vicious in this regard, um, then you make labor more independent because there's all sorts of reasons why labor shouldn't be totally married to the Democratic Party. As my friend Michael Lynn points out, if you go visit the, the, the Twitter homepage of the head of the AFL-CIO, at least until recently, I don't know if she's changed it, but the pinned tweet at the top is, you know, uh, maximal reproductive rights are workers' rights. I can't remember what the exact thing was, but it's against Dobbs. Now, tons of rank and file members of AFL-CIO are not quite where the Democratic left is on abortion. They may not be pro-life 100% the way, the way I am, but they're definitely not like, you know, abortion up to the, you know, birthing table or whatever, like to the last minute. But why is it that they have to basically put up with Democrats? It's because the Republican Party is so awful. And so if the Republican Party actually wants the labor vote and wants to uh, divorce this sort of marriage of the Democratic Party and organized labor, it just needs to be a little bit less horrible. Not that hard. So in this last section, I just love to ask you, because you've kind of alluded to this, where does the Biden administration's efforts in the categories we're talking about today, whether it's, you know, Lena Khan or Rohit Chopra, who's been on the show, where mm -hmm. does that kind of find you politically? So, cause obviously we're not talking about foreign policy in this podcast and you are very, if you, if you, if you think that you're a Biden shill, read your writing on foreign policy, yeah. uh, very yeah. much like, because and once again, different conversation, but that's just for listeners to think about, but where does this, where, where do you find the Biden administration on these categories? Uh, on these issues, I'm quite Biden pilled to put it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I think that in many ways it's the first post neoliberal administration since the rise of neoliberalism. Whenever you want to place that, 
Some some people say Carter, some people say Reagan, but at any rate, it's the first post neoliberal administration. Quickly define neoliberalism: the idea that not only should the market be left alone, but market metrics and market market rationalities should also determine how we do politics. Right? It's a it's a much more radical neoliberalism is much more radical than old fashioned, you know, classical liberalism or kind of conventional conservatism. It goes further. It says government should uh you know actively make remake much of life so that it's more market oriented and it's a it was a bipartisan consensus by the by the, the, the 1990s so much so that famously as you know um uh, marshall the it, when when margaret thatcher was asked what, what's your grace, greatest accomplishment she responded tony blair um and likewise in the united states you know plenty of neoliberal democrats in the 90s pursued similar goals um, and the real big problem with neoliberalism is is what I call depoliticization. That is, it takes issues that are eminently about politics, public politics, and how we contest them, and and shoves them into you know kind of private, non justiciable, non political realms where the weak are typically have their hands tied. So the arbitration arbitration example I gave is is one um uh, another is just how we how we did free trade right it was presented not not as something that was like democratically contestable but oh you know it's it's this is the wave of the future we can't make stuff anymore it's just inevitable that we you know we have to ship all of our our factories to places that don't have any labor or environmental protections etc cetera, etc cetera. these were not inevitable natural developments they were a result of elite political choices but ordinary people lost their say. And I see the Biden administration, like many others, uh, I see the Biden administration as the first administration that's really meaningfully pushing beyond that. It does that in rhetoric. Uh, I'm sure you you listen to um, Jake Sullivan's, the he's the national security advisor, his address on the Washington consensus and how it's been a failure at home and abroad. The Washington consensus is just another byword for, for neoliberalism. So they say it in rhetoric, but also in practice, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act. Now, there are legitimate conservative criticisms of these because uh, these are forms of industrial policy, essentially, bringing back chip manufacturing to home, both on security grounds and otherwise, because it's the industry of the future, or, you know, just spending a lot on on uh, on uh, green developments and so forth with the, the Inflation Reduction Act. There are legitimate uh, Republican criticisms. One is, for example, some conservatives complain that the CHIPS Act doesn't actually spend enough money. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, conservatives complain, is too focused on green energy at the expense of other forms of, you know, industrial development. All fine. I mean, by the way, I do think there might there are good jobs to be had out of green. China seems to think that way. So we should as well. I mean, we shouldn't write off green as everything green is not bogus. It's, it's a serious industry and a serious development. But anyway, let me grant that, that the, the kind of conservative complaints. At the end of the day, the Biden administration has an industrial policy. I'll wait. I'll wait. Let's wait to see Republicans come up with an alternative. They will not. I bet, guarantee you. So the only thing they can do is is complain or just go against the idea of industrial policy with the same old cliches. Oh, you don't distort the market, as Kevin McCarthy said, et cetera. You shouldn't distort the market. While all of our, you know, China does that. Every every other country, every other country that's developed seriously has distorted the market and picked winners and losers, contrary to sort of 18th century Adam Smith theory. So, you know, in short. And then, of course, on labor issues, sometimes there's been missteps like the railroad workers uh, over last summer, as you remember. Oh, no, sorry, last fall. Um, but that's that's that issue has been resolved. But on the whole, you know, I'm I'm pretty Biden pilled on domestic economic policies. The problem is that it's all bound up with foreign policy, where my views are more complicated and critical of the administration. And of course, cultural policy, I tend to be on the right. So what that leaves me is. I, it actually leaves me in a very kind of uh, exciting and unsettled place. I see uh, great hope in certain individual Republican lawmakers like Senator Rubio, Senator Vance, Senator Hawley. They don't talk about this stuff exactly the way the left wants. So it's often thankless. Uh, 
they don't they're more gradualist because they're coming from the right and they have to bring a constituencies over so it's imperfect and of course the left says ah no you can't be pro worker because you don't discuss these issues exactly the way we would discuss them and you're too gradualist but i think there's those are the green shoots and with the biden administration being as resolutely post neoliberal as it is there's a real possibility of building a new consensus and that's what i try to do in my sort of public intellectual life and almost private too like i bring together you know, really surprising groups of people, you know, people who would otherwise never find themselves around the dinner table, um, you know, lawmakers, et cetera, policymakers and people of left and right to try to formulate a new kind of uh, political economic consensus. So but but what it does mean is that I'm constantly like on my toes and a little bit uh, I have to bring over a left constituency and win their trust that I mean it when I say it, I'm pro-union. But then to try to convince people on the right that there is a conservative tradition in favor of thinking this way. Um, and then there is a matter of, you know, what do you do with Biden? It's a, in, in on these issues. It's much, much better than anything we've had in generation or two. Uh, again, it leaves me in a in a sort of discomforting and, and, and unsettled place, but it's also an exhilarating place. So for the last question, I'm really fascinated by how directly you identify with the New Deal. And this kind of like fills a hobby horse I've had recently. I've done a lot of uh, episodes in FDR. And I just think that there's a, especially given the fact as you alluded to this, there's a certain way that conservative uh, institutions discuss the New Deal. They're hyper-focused on, well, like, you know, did this specific economic policy work? Like, was this the most efficient allocation? They focused on the economic side of the New Deal and not on the political aspect of the project, which to me was, oh, wow, it's the 1930s, the old order is collapsing. How do you put together a political program that obviously involves the economy, political economy, sociocultural ideals, culture, et cetera, to actually keep the country together in the face of like fascism to the right um, and communism to the left? It was, a, it was a tremendously successful political project. And I don't think we should start by just you know, getting nerdy and saying, well, you know, if they'd done this tax policy adjustment, the GDP growth would have been this level in 1933. That kind of misses the point of the project. So can you just close with um, your understanding of the New Deal, how you kind of really found yourself there and like what that means for you going forward? Take as long as you need to go because this is the final question. Yeah, I mean, I, I like many who read or look into the new deal you suddenly become you 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 become excited both but for me it's not nostalgic right I'm, it's not like i think we have the exact uh, you know same configuration of a macro economy and uh culture etc some many things have changed since then but this the fundamental recognition of the new deal in my telling which i mentioned in tyranny inc the fundamental recognition is that uh, the model of competitive capitalism that had reigned in the United States in the 19th century uh, and the early decades of the 20th century had actually failed capitalism and was risking all sorts of social turmoil. I think that should sound familiar to us in some ways today. Um, the, 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 competitive, the, the competitive model, first of all, was based on the New Dealers recognized that kind of illusory economy that hadn't existed even in Lincoln's time. You know, when Lincoln gave his address to the Wisconsin Agricultural Society, which is his big address, um, kind of the emblematic presidential speech on political economy in the 19th century, he still, Lincoln, unfortunately, for all his visionary um, leadership on, obviously, on the Civil War and so forth, Lincoln still has one foot in the Arcadia of the late 18th century before the Industrial Revolution uh, displaces the Yeoman Republic and creates an economy in which there are a few, few employers and many, many other employees, wage earners, who will never become their own bosses. Lincoln's vision was that there is no class antagonism between labor and capital because labor and capital are really the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so those, uh, the, the worker will eventually, the penniless beginning, beginner in the world, as he famously said, will start out poor, but then work, and then he'll be able to afford his own tool or his own land, and then he'll get to hire some other penniless beginner, and then that person becomes a boss. And so he really thought of the 
labor and capital as a kind of composite figure in the same figure. That economy didn't exist in, by Lincoln's time. You know, he was being a romantic in the mid 19th century. By the by the early decades of the 20th century, by clinging to that romance, the U.S. had plunged itself into crisis because in reality, most people were just workers for their duration of their lives. And if they didn't have enough power and if they couldn't mount enough power in response uh, in collective bargaining, et cetera, and collective action, then they wouldn't be, be paid enough. And when they are not paid enough, they couldn't even afford the goods that they were producing, therefore generating a demand crisis that really threatened the whole system. And as you said, you had communism and fascism both sort of biting on both sides. Um, so the 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 uh, FDR comes along and the New Dealers more broadly. And we should really think of multiple New Deals. It's mm -hmm. not just one. It's a kind of series of moves. But at any rate, they come along and they have this kind of more realistic view of what the economy is like. You don't have you know, a gazillion yeomen and mechanics and so forth going up against each other in super competitive markets in which the price point really says something meaningful about supply and demand. You have an economy which already by the late 19th century, most industries were dominated by just a few sellers, right? Like Otis Elevator controlled 70% of its market. American tobacco controlled 90% of its market. In those conditions, you don't really have price competition. Price is really an index of relative bargaining power. It's a it's a political and it can it's a political signal. It's not really a um you know supply and demand strictly speaking signal. So wages are much more political than the kind of classical economic theory had been willing to grant. New dealers recognize this. And so they what do they do? They as I said, they the main effort, I think the centerpiece was the Wagner Act of making it encouraging. Congress encourages not just allowing encourages collective bargaining in most industries. So what does that what does that result in? It results in a period of mass prosperity of uh, innovation. This is the nuclear age. This is the space age, and it's an age which a lot of a lot of our you know grandparents and great grandparents recognize as a generally happy, prosperous age. There were issues, obviously, for example, the 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 stain of uh, of legalized. Uh, racism still would take several several more decades to fully erase. But as a kind of economic matter, the fundamental thing that I fundamental element of the New Deal that I appreciate, which I, and I think we should go back to, is just economic realism. Economic realism. Um, at the you know on, on this point that markets don't don't operate the way that. Uh, econ 101 courses still teach you know with just the price point being this perfect crystallization of of uh, supply and demand no it's it's a matter of how much ba bargaining power you have and if you if you're a worker the way you increase your bargaining power is by joining hands with others like you and bargaining collectively bearing bringing collective action to bear so that realism is what we need do we need the exact same matrix of policies as fdr no conditions have changed etc but that sort of realistic spirit about how markets really work is a stroke of genius. And, uh, we, you know, I, I just take pride in it as a as an American by choice. I look back in that era with almost the kind of misty eyed reverence. Almost. Well, Saurabh, that's a great place to end it. Could you, you just uh, shout the book out? It's out. We're recording this on the 14th, but it will be out um, on the 15th. Yeah, the book is Tyranny, Inc., How Private Power Crushed American Liberty and What to Do About It. And it'll be out uh, Tuesday, August 15th at wherever books are sold, including, you know, Amazon, which is one of the villains of the book. <laughs> if folks enjoy this conversation, get it from the Realignments Bookshop so I could get 10% of that cut. Thanks for joining me, Saurav. Thank you, Marshall.